Good morning, church. My name is Krista Gonzalez, and I'm the youth director here at Liberty United Methodist Church, and we are so glad that you are joining us in worship. Whether this is your first time worshiping with us or you've worshiped with us many times before, we would love for you to sign in as if you were here in person worshiping with us. So if you are watching on a Sunday morning, you can click on the connection card tab above, or you can also go to our website under the worship tab and click on guest connection there. But here at LUMC, we exist to be a Christian community where people encounter Jesus and where lives are changed. And that is our hope and prayer, that each and every one of you would have a meaningful experience with God this morning. So let us continue and begin our worship as we are led in song. When you speak, darkness has to bow. If you didn't have this final hour. When you speak, Mountains rise and fall, it tears down every wall around me. When you speak, breathe upon the dust, you come alive in us. When you speak, you silence every fear. Feel your spirit here around us. Let there be light. Let there be light until it fills up every space. Come and have your way. Let there be light. Let there be light. Just one. Just one word and I am changed. Come and have your way. 
This world is not my home. The fight is not my own. These burdens aren't my future. The empty tune has shown. I am bound for glory. I am free. At this time, I'd like to invite the congregation to join me in a season of prayer. And as we enter this season of prayer, I want to share an important announcement with you all. Friends, Liberty United Methodist Church is relaunching public worship on Sunday, July 5th. I say relaunch because our church has not been closed during this season, but we have been careful to practice social distancing. On July 5th, We will resume in-person worship at both campuses. We will contain the number of participants to 50 people per service for a time so that we can worship while remaining at least six feet apart. Our service times will be 8.15 and 11 a.m. at sunset and 9.30 at our Rush Creek campus. These times will allow us to disinfect before and in between and after each service so that we may continue to keep our congregation safe. We are also asking you to sign up to attend a service so that we may anticipate the flow of worshipers and maintain those CDC safety procedures. While we relaunch public worship, we will continue to maintain one online worship experience each week from both our sunset and our Rush Creek campuses. We don't want to miss an opportunity to connect with those in our congregation who need to maintain social distance because of health issues. As your pastor, I want 
to ask you as a congregation to make this a major focus of your prayer life for the next two weeks. We have staff and tech ministries and hospitality teams working to discern how to keep us all safe and allow us to be together. And I ask that we all pray for wisdom and patience in this crucial time. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious and almighty God, we ask at this time that you would indeed give our congregation wisdom, give us patience. As we gather together for in-person worship once again, that you would give us open hearts and open minds and allow us to recalibrate what we do as a congregation so that we can keep people safe, but we can continue to worship with as many people as possible. So the message of Jesus will go out powerfully from this place, uh, both online and live and in person. God, I pray that you would sustain us and guide us to the best practices for all of that to the end of your glory and your name. And I ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who taught us all to pray this prayer together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, we're going to go here and mark it up. We're going to go to yellow and just get that out of the way Good morning and welcome to worship at Liberty United Methodist Church. I'm Steve Klaus, the lead pastor. I'm so very honored to be able to welcome you to our services. I want to say a special welcome to those of us who are joining us online and our guests, as well as the members of our faithful congregation. I want to begin this morning by wishing a happy Father's Day to all our dads out there. Do you remember the first moment that you held your child as a father? I recall holding both Aaron and Emma in my arms and telling them that I would protect them uh, from anything and take care of them. Now, that promise hasn't been tested very often, but there have been a few scares. In fact, the last times that I will ever sprint anywhere on the face of this planet happened as I chased down Aaron or Emma to keep them from either riding or running out into the street when they were little. Whew. I'm so glad those days are past us. Being a dad sometimes requires almost superpowers. I want to invite you to follow along as we share stories, more stories of Elisha, who had divine superpowers as his role as a prophet. I'm going to read from 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. The wife of a man from the company of prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour all of the oil into the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
The passage for today is one of a series of small incidents that take place in 2 Kings, which center on Elisha's relationship with the other prophets of Israel. Once Elisha crosses the Jordan after watching Elijah depart in a whirlwind, he becomes the leader of the company of prophets that followed Elisha and Elijah to the Jordan. Elisha and these men, sometimes referred to as the sons of the prophets, are itinerant. They travel for ministry on a job-to-job basis. And for the next few chapters in 2 Kings, we witness these men following Elisha throughout the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, and I want to share a few of their important stories today. At the beginning of 2 Kings 4, a widow from this company of prophets approaches Elisha and asks for his help. She owes a large debt, and if she cannot pay, her sons will be sold into slavery to pay off the creditors. The slavery that is spoken of here would indenture her sons to other families for at least six years. The terms of these agreements could be brutal. Although it wasn't a lifetime of enslavement, there's no guarantee that the widow would see her boys again in her lifetime. Tradition tells us that this woman is likely the the widow of Obadiah, the administrator of King Ahab who hid prophets in caves to spare their lives after they were threatened by Queen Jezebel. The debt was incurred through Obadiah borrowing funds to feed these prophets. Elisha has a responsibility to help a member of the extended family of the company of prophets and an opportunity here to do justice. Elisha asks if the widow has anything on hand to pay the debt, and she replies that she has just a small jar of olive oil. Elisha says, go around and ask your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Get all you can. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour the oil into the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. Now, although this would seem strange to us, olive oil was an important commodity back in that time, and trading it or selling it could bring a very high price. So the widow does as she's instructed by Elisha, and the oil miraculously fills all of the jars that she has gathered. The multiplying oil is a divine gift. Her family is spared, and we catch a glimpse of how God provides. At the end of 2 Kings 4, we find two more examples of how God uses Elisha to provide for the company of prophets. As Elisha and the prophets travel from Gilgal to a new location, they stop for a time of teaching. And while the men are gathered, Elisha instructs a servant to go and begin preparing stew for dinner. The servant scouts the area looking for ingredients and finds a vine with gourds on it. He gathers up all of the gourds, takes them back to the camp, cuts them up, and puts them into the stew. And as the men begin eating the stew, they become nauseous, and they cry out to Elisha, Man of God, there is death in the pot. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but I've been to an awful lot of church potlucks in my time, And I have never heard a party-stopping line quite like that one before. These guys who are so hungry aren't just telling Elisha that the food is bad, however. You see, in that desert region, there is a melon that grows wild, which the translated name for would loosely be called apples of Satan. They cause dysentery that can be fatal, and some of the men no doubt recognize the taste. Dysentery plus desert equals death. And so Elisha takes some flour and tosses it into the pot and says a prayer, and the food is detoxified, and we catch a glimpse of how God protects. This story is followed immediately by another account of feeding the prophets at the end of 2 Kings 4. As the men are traveling from place to place with Elisha, the country is in the midst of a famine. And while they are on the road, Elisha and the prophets are met by a man who gives them 20 loaves of bread and some extra grain. At this point, the company of prophets now numbers about a hundred men, 
And Elisha instructs the servant who received the bread to feed the men with it, but he protests that it's not enough food. So Elisha replies, give it to the people to eat, for this is what the Lord says, they will eat and have some left over. They do, and the bread and the faith of the men are multiplied, and we catch another glimpse of how God provides. The final story I want to share with you today happens sometime later in the life that Elisha and the prophets share together. After following Elisha for an extended period of time, the company of prophets has grown from 50 to 100 to even more people, and they decide to locate and create a school, but they quickly run out of space. The Bible records these prophets saying to Elisha, the place where we sit under your teaching is too small. Let's go and build a place for us to meet. Elisha agrees, so the company make their way down to the Jordan to cut timber. While the men are cutting timber, one of them loses the head of an iron axe, causing great distress because the axe was borrowed. And the borrower of the axe would have had to pay the lender back at a very steep price because iron was precious at that time, and this itinerant prophet would have gone into debt. As the men are lamenting the loss, Elisha overhears them and has this exchange. The holy man said, where did it sink? And the man showed him the place. He cut off a branch and tossed it at the spot. The axe had floated up. Grab it, he said to the man, and the man reached out and took it. Once more, God worked through Elisha to keep a prophet's family out of debt, and we catch another glimpse of how God provides. These small scenes from the life of Elisha demonstrate why he has been called the people's prophet or a prophet of the heart. It seemed that no detail about the lives of the people that he led was too mundane or insignificant for the prophet to intervene. In fact, when Elisha is visited by someone great like Naaman, the great military chieftain of the enemy Arameans, Elisha sends him away to receive his miracle. But we find Elisha drawing very near to pay off the debt of the widow, to feed his own men, and to fix their tools. As a prophet, Elisha lives up to his name, which means, my God saves. I think that these stories of Elisha point towards an understanding of what it means to be a good father. Now, one reason I chose these stories is because we catch Elisha engaged in classic dad behavior. He's traveling outdoors with a lot of other dudes. He cooks outdoors and helps others to get the recipe correct. He even works with power tools because I assure you an axe is an Iron Age power tool. But seriously though, Elisha's demeanor and care during these episodes demonstrate God's call on his life. His calling is to bring God's message wherever he goes, but also to raise up other leaders in the company of prophets who will carry that message beyond Elisha's lifetime. He does this by helping to provide for them and protect the well-being and the reputation of everyone under his care. And providing protection and care are the very essence of what it means to be a good dad. I have to confess that I don't always get it right as a father, but when I do, it's usually because I'm following a biblical example of what it means to care for others in the way that God does. The presence of stories like these are a powerful reminder to us that ministry involves attending to the seemingly ordinary needs and the anxieties of people coping with life's routines. God cares for all things, big and small, just as a good father does. These principles of protection and providence also relate to how we function as a church. We may not be able to fill empty vessels with oils, but we have a responsibility to take the plight of the destitute seriously. We may not have 
the know-how to detoxify poison or multiply food, but we have a moral imperative to feed the hungry with our resources. I'm so proud of the ways that our congregation is involved in these types of ministries, and I'd like to share the story of our partnership with St. Mary's Food Kitchen, which God has been using in this critical time to feed hungry people. I'm Rick Wolzak. I coordinate the volunteers for the St. Mary's Food Kitchen. I come from a really big family. I have nine brothers and sisters, and my mother passed away when the oldest was about 16 years old, and so we have all helped one another and so when I came here 15 years ago, um, I'm going to help others. And that's what I've been able to do with the St. Mary's Food Kitchen. We normally serve 275 people. Uh, after we served that number at the beginning of March, they were serving 500 people. And a week later, they were serving 700 people. So last month, we prepared 700 sandwiches and bagged lunches to take down to the food kitchen. While we prepare the food, we follow most of the instructions that you see posted just about every place that you go nowadays. Social distancing, um, gloves, mask, and we have a sign-in sheet uh, at the beginning with the atrium to the uh, Family Life Center. Uh, our workstations are uh, quite a space apart, and we sanitize the touch surfaces like the doorknobs and the chairs uh, every time we prepare lunches this way. With so many people hurting as a result of the uh, COVID-19, it's really nice that uh, so many people are coming together to help others. Uh, when I have asked people if they can help prepare the lunches or take them down, uh, just about everybody has said, sure. Uh, if I've asked them, do they want to do this task or that task, they say, whichever one you need me to do, Rick. I want to say thank you to everybody that has been able to help uh, during the past couple of months, uh, whether that is the volunteers that come and prepare the sandwiches and bag the lunches and then take them down to the St. Mary's Food Kitchen, or to the vendors that have really helped us out uh, by providing things like the uh, meat, things like that. Everybody has really been uh, helpful, and I say thank you. As a result of the St. Mary's Food Kitchen, I've been able to see two things. I've been able to see a lot of people in need, and I've been able to see an awful lot of people willing to help others. I hope I get to see you all in person real soon. I want to express my thanks to Rick and all the members of our volunteer corps who are helping us to feed the hungry just like Elisha did. The stories that Rick shared remind me of the ways that God worked in the past. And God worked through Elisha to multiply oil and bread in a miraculous fashion so that debts were paid and hungry people could be fed. Oil flowed until all of the money that was needed was available. Bread was broken into piece after piece after piece until it fed everyone who was hungry. I still believe that God works that way in supernatural ways like that today, just as God did through Elisha. I've seen people healed of things or protected from injuries that have no rational explanation. But I also believe that God works through us to multiply things miraculously. 
I've seen it every week during this COVID-19 crisis. As people go to our little food pantry, our members go and drop off food every day. And every day, two or three people come and take what they need, and God multiplies our excess. I've never lived in a community as affluent as Liberty in my whole life. Folks, we have the resources in our congregation to take care of hundreds of people, and the need out there right now is very great. We have ministries and a benevolence fund to help with all of those things. The good news for this Father's Day is that the miracles of the oil and the bread happen today through you. God provides and protects through you, and you get to be a part of that miracle. Thanks be to the prophet who reminds us in word and deed and name that our God saves. Would you pray together with me, please? God, we give thanks today for our fathers and all of our parents and for the ways that you provide and protect for each of us. May we never take that for granted. May we see you sending us out to a world that is hungry and in need and needs protection, and may we provide all of those things. May we be the thing that multiplies all of the ways and all of the needs that are represented in our community and that they are met through our ministries. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now as we continue in worship and respond to the word both spoken and sung this morning, we prepare to give back to God just a portion of what God has already blessed us with. During this time, we like to shed light on a ministry that your gifts go to support. And this morning, we are highlighting our children's ministry. We would like to thank you for the many ways that you support our mission to help children encounter Jesus so that their lives can be changed. If you'd like to give a gift this morning, you can go ahead and click on the Give tab above, or you can visit our website, which will be up on the screen, and you can make a donation there. But your generous gifts have helped us keep in contact with families and children through this time that we've not been able to be together in person. And we are so excited to be able to offer LUMC's first ever virtual VBS, Technicolor Journey, which is going to be July 21st through the 23rd. So families can go ahead and join in the fun and can still register online today. So thank you. Thank you for supporting events like our virtual VBS and for supporting the children of LUMC. So please join me as I pray over the gifts this morning. God, thank you so much for the many ways that you have blessed this community. God, we ask that you stir in our hearts so that we can be generous with our finances, so that we can recognize that these gifts are not our own, but that they come from you. So God, help us to be generous, stir in our hearts, and take these gifts and allow them to make a difference in this community. God, we love you, and we ask this in your name. Amen.
glad that you joined us in worship this morning. And we do want to let you know that we are going to be continuing our online worship at least through June 28th. And we are also going to be continuing our Facebook Live devotionals, which are on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 11 a.m. And now before Pastor Steve sends us forth, I have one invitation for us. So at Liberty United Methodist Church, we know how difficult these past few months have been. It's been difficult on our Liberty community, on the Kansas City community, and our global community at large. And so we want to take a special Saturday in June to highlight and serve alongside of our community's key agents and come together as the hands and feet of Jesus. So please join the Liberty United Methodist Church community while we uh, come together in service on Saturday, June 27th for our Serving Together While Apart event. While we can't be together in person, we can still be intentional with our time apart. So go ahead and head over to lumcmo.org slash Serving Saturday for more information and to sign up. And be sure to tag LUMC in your photos on social media as well. We hope that you can join us for this really meaningful event. Would you receive today's benediction? Friends, as you begin your work week this day, go forth with the confidence of Elisha, a man who did twice as many miracles as his master, a man that God used to provide for and to protect the people of God. And may we always remember that you and I are the miraculous presence in this world that God uses to multiply goodness and grace.